Hey everybody, before we get into today's episode, I want to take a minute to introduce our latest service called Crowd Insight by Gadgetflow. It's an awesome tool we made to help you get honest feedback for your upcoming crowdfunding project. Some of the big results we've seen include increased conversion rate, finding out why your project isn't performing well, and getting feedback you need from potential backers. So please head over to gadgetflow.com slash crowd insight to check it out today. You can also find a link in this week's show notes. Now let's get into the episode. Hello world, this is the Gadget Flow Podcast, a show about everything related to products, entrepreneurship, marketing, and crowdfunding. This week, we got to chat with Eric Huberman of Hawk Media. And basically, they have worked with countless businesses and organizations to take their marketing to the next level, and they are total experts in the field. Eric is incredible at what he does, and he gave a lot of valuable insight in this episode. So let's just jump right on into our interview with Eric Huberman. All right, I am here with Eric Huberman of Hawk Media. Eric, how are you doing today, man? Doing really well. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. You are coming to us from Los Angeles, correct? Yep, Santa Monica. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, I, I want to jump right into the interview. We're really excited to have you on. Um, everything you guys are doing at Hawk Media is like incredible, and there's a lot of it. So, <laughs> so but first, before we kind of jump into it, I want to get a little bit of a backstory. Maybe for people who are listening who don't know who you are or what Hawk Media exactly does, can you just give like a, you know, a brief overview of what that is? Sure. Uh, yeah, my backstory is in e-commerce. So I've had three e-commerce companies over the last 10 years, uh, one in music, two in fashion, sold the two fashion companies. And about five years ago, started just advising and consulting for brands, large and small, on how to grow revenue using digital and work with big Fortune 100s down to a lot of startups and just saw that there was this huge problem with getting talented marketers. Like between the two options of hiring in-house and hiring an agency, neither one was very good in-house, like good luck attracting talent, affording talent. And then you end up with the whole forest from the trees problem and like not knowing what's going on in the ecosystem, hence why agencies exist. But 99% of agencies are built by people that have never successfully built a business, don't know what they're selling, don't know what they're doing, but they sell services in which are basically snake oil. And then the few that end up being good on the agency side quickly get really expensive, want long commitments, et cetera. And so just didn't like the ecosystem. There wasn't a good agency that was easy to work with and kind of decided to hire my own team. Initially not planning on building anything big. I just wanted my own little SWAT team so I could rely on the team of people. But then it grew and in four and a half years, we went from seven to now we're about 140 people. Goodness, that's a huge jump. So, and, and what's the timeline? When did you start until now? Uh, what did I start till now? Sorry. Sorry. So when did you actually start Hawk as it oh, is, yeah. as it is now and then to, till today, like how you've grown to that many people in what amount of time? Four and a half years. Goodness, man. So. That's big. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fast. It's, it's happened pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I really like what you said. I think that's something that I wish we're talked about a little bit more, but I think it's just not very uh, ex- acceptable almost is that there is so much like fake marketers out there. <laughs> and you're right. Like I, if I'm working with people, I want to know that they've done it before on their own before they're teaching me anything. But I think it's just true. That's just such a fallacy right now. And so many people are quote unquote marketing geniuses or whatever, but they've never actually done anything. No, I, I get a at least a message a week from someone saying along the lines of, and I have one that came in yesterday. Uh, hey, Eric, you know, I love what you do. I, I just started my agency and would really love to learn more about marketing. So if you could, you know, get, get on a phone call and give me some pointers, that'd be great. So to back up a second, I just started my agency and would really love to learn marketing. <laughs> so he's selling marketing, but he doesn't know anything about it yet. And by the way, people are hiring these people because we, we deal with it all the time where like we're talking to a company like, well, this guy will do it for 500 bucks. And it's right. like, just think about what you just said. <laughs> Take exactly. a step back. And like what some, what we, and I, my line back to that, because we get that, not that often, but we get it enough that I, I always ask, 
what would you do for five hundred dollars? Would you do it? And think about do you want that person even doing the amount of work you would do for five hundred bucks? Right. So always interesting. Yeah, definitely, man. Well, that that's kind of funny. It, it was one of my later questions, but maybe I can ask now, and then we can jump into a, a little bit more what you guys do. But one one thing is, that I've always liked asking my guests, and I think this will be a good question for you, is what what do you think is um one of the biggest myths about marketing a business in today's landscape? What is the biggest myths I would say is you have to keep up and it's always changing and like you have to keep up on the ever changing landscape of marketing. Like don't get me wrong, it shifts, there's changes, there's tweaks, but marketing still the fundamentals are the same. And mm. so it's not as much of a, you know, crazy volatile space as people think it is like, the same strategies we I used to build my last e-commerce company six years ago are still the core of a digital marketing strategy today. So okay. I came wrong. A lot of nuance in there and a lot of different changes along the platforms, but the general idea is very, very similar. And so I think, yeah, the biggest myth is like, oh God, it's, you know, what are we going to, I think the people get shiny object syndrome and like chase every, you know, every new platform, every new available marketing strategy there is, and you know, what, what are we doing about AI and what are we doing about ARVR and what are we doing on Snapchat, et cetera. But I've learned like, you can wait till it's working. Like let other people be the first users. And uh, you, you, you know, there's going to be the one company that gets a bunch of press for doing something new and exciting. And then there's going to be everyone else that follows that, that doesn't, that loses a bunch of money. Like Snapchat as an example, now it's starting to work for people. But the mm-hmm. past, I, I don't know how long it's been, a year or so, you know, or I think it's been more than that, a year and a half they launched their ad platform, like, it have been a waste of money on that platform. And, like, we tested it a couple of times with really small budgets just to see what happened. And, like, okay, if this isn't working, we're not going to go down this path right now. Let's wait to just keep our ear to the ground until we see that it's actually starting to produce. And then we can jump in. We right. just saved all of our clients a ton of money and because they would have just wasted money. And, that, like, and then we miss out on maybe a month or two of when it's working, but now we can jump in. And again, like the risk reward there, like we've just learned you can, you don't, for, there's no first mover advantage. You might as well just wait till it's working and then jump in. Mm, I love that. I think that's so true, man. So true. So yeah. I, wanna, I wanna back up a little bit. So at Hawk Media, I know we've talked already a little bit about what you guys do, but give me just broad strokes. What do you guys offer? Like what are your, you know, the, the keystone things yep. you offer? Yeah. So it's, I mean, the, the core of the business, we call ourselves an outsourced CMO and marketing team. So I'd say the biggest differentiator between us and like a digital agency is we put a high level strategist on every account that we call an outsourced CMO. And it's basically a strategy consultant meets project manager. And they're leveraging the fact that we've worked with over a thousand brands as of this month, actually big milestone now. So, you know, having that much data, that much knowledge, they pull from our internal database, which we've built something called Hawk IQ that anonymizes and you know pulls in all that data so that we can make benchmarking decisions and everything from the historical data we've had. So mm. we're able to derive and what we've seen, we actually have numbers to this now. So on average, a company that works with us in the first six months, if they don't work with us on strategy, they grow at an average of about 110% in the first six months, which is still a good number. We've doubled companies in the first six months on average, and that's across you know the thousand companies. But if they incorporate strategy, that number turn goes from 110% to 274% is the average. Wow. So that little strategy, you know, that oversight and that strategy actually increases returns by two and a half X. And that's what we do that I haven't, I still haven't seen another company doing it that way. Hmm. And it's just, you know, basically another line item. And then we, you know, we do Facebook advertising, search marketing, email marketing, web design, content strategy, influencer marketing. Uh, what am I missing? someone's going to kill me here, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and, and, and run the gamut on media buying as well. We also do radio TV, um, have a production team and, you know, photo and video work. So yeah, we, you know, basically over time we've built out full capabilities to, you know, control our own destiny here because what we've realized is, you know, our people are a product and like, you're not going to outsource your product. Like that's, mm. that's how you build a business really quick. So they're all here full time. Got it. That's awesome, man. So I'm curious, do you have maybe an example of like a transformation that you'd want to share? Like some, like a cool story of maybe a company that wasn't doing well or yeah. Like what's a good transformation story you guys were a part of? 
So the mo- one that happened this year that was super exciting, and they let us publish a case study, which is why I'm comfortable saying this, mm. is Lorna Jane, which... I, so my last business was an activewear brand that I sold to Bowie Total Fitness. And so I've known Lorna Jane, about Lorna Jane for years, even though it's a women's activewear brand. And if, you know, those of you that aren't familiar, it's really prominent, you know, came up around the time Lulu and then got really popular as well. They're from Australia. They've been in the U.S. for 10 years. So it's a good brand, really good mm-hmm. brand. They've done well. It wasn't a struggling brand. But we came in, you know, now I think like eight months ago, but we came in and within four months, we tripled their revenue. Wow. Through putting in our, our best practices. So like, and we're, and with a, or 12 time return on their advertising it, right away out the gate. So it's like, you know, when things line up, align and do well, and we've had much higher returns than that. The reason that's exciting to me is this is not a, a new brand that was trying to figure it out. And then we save them. We've had, you know, 30 time return on ads then in the right situation. But with these guys, it was someone that's done it right. That's built a great brand that has a great company. And just through some best practices and us coming in and tweaking things and taking over, we were still able to take something that's doing really well and triple that. Because it's like, if a company is just in a free dive and you and they're just screwing everything up, to save that company by just doing the right things, like, I mean, you, you hopefully can, unless there's something really broken. Right. Like that, that, I, to me, that's not the win to celebrate. The win to celebrate is when you take something great and make it even better. And that's what we were able to do there. Absolutely. That's so cool. I love that story. So I'm also, I'm a little bit curious about like your guys process. Like, so working with that company, like, and again, this is like the don't give away all your secrets or whatever you're comfortable sharing, but I'm just curious, like, how does it work? So say, you know, that company comes to you guys and asks for help, then, then what does it look like from A to Z till the finish point? Yep. When, you know, what does that look like? Yeah. So everyone we work with, we start with an audit and go through everything they've already done. So we can put together, frankly, a proposal that actually fits their needs. So everything's custom tailored. And I, you know, that's where like our pitch of being a la carte month to month, like, you know, it's the month to month is, you know, it gives a little bit of peace of mind, but if anyone's coming and working with us for a month, they're just wasting time. Like there's no reason that you, we won't get anything done in a month, just like hiring an employee for a month. It's just, mm. we're just getting up to speed, but on the uh, a la carte piece, we really do try to like cater every proposal to like, where is the low hanging fruit that we can start with, show you some early wins. So you see, we actually know what we're doing and then we can always expand from there. So that, you know, with anyone, we'll go look at their analytics, look at their current ad spend strategy, look at their marketing strategy and then go, okay, this all makes sense. You should keep doing this because we're not, we're also not going to take over anything they're already doing well. Mm. So if we see they're already, you know, they've got a great Facebook marketer or a great search marketer, whatever. They exist. We don't believe that we're the only ones. There are a few of them, but we're not the only ones. And so we definitely, I just had that conversation yesterday with actually a potential client. It's like, why don't you just take everything? I'm like, you're doing really well on Facebook. Don't hire. Like, there's no reason to bring us on for that. Maybe we do a few things differently, but like, let's focus on the stuff that you need help with. And then if eventually that becomes a low hanging fruit, we'll go into that. But for now, let's focus here. And so with, you know, again, Lorna Jane or any company, we look at that and then we, you know, get, show them the proposal. This is, you know, the cost. This is what we're thinking. This is why we're thinking it. Make sure that they agree because a lot of times there's nuance in the business we aren't aware of. So once that happens, jump in. We actually identify the team members that we're going to give them uh, based on three factors. One, honestly, most important, bandwidth. We mm-hmm. want to make sure they have time to put into it. Uh, kind of a no-brainer. But two, uh, do they have a good cultural alignment? We lose way more clients and we don't, it, that sounds bad. It's not like a fire hose here, but we lose more clients on uh, culture fits and communication style than anything. That mm. is the number one. And so like what we've noticed is if we do amazing work, but it's not communicated well, we lose that client. Happened last month. We have a client that we have grown 30 X in a year and they fired us because they didn't feel like we were paying attention. Oh my gosh. Feel. The word, yeah, it happens. And, that, and it's insane. And I argued with them and said, you guys realize what kind of a mistake you're making. But <laughs> if that's the thing. If people run by their feelings. As much as people seem like logical creatures, feelings matter. And so, you know, we had, they had an amazing, talented team that apparently was, a, and I know the team, so I'm just going to say to it, was a little too low-key and relaxed for them. Where that doesn't mean their work was relaxed, just their communication style. And so we definitely look at, again, the second factor of who we're teaming is, 
you know, some people want that type like me, fast talking, high strung kind of person on the mm-hmm. phone and working with them. And other people would, you know, hate talking to me. I've had people that are like, I don't want Eric anywhere near this. Like, <laughs> I want to talk to you if you're calming me down. So yeah. totally fine. So that's the second and most, and probably the most important factor. And then third, uh, we want to make sure that the person that we're putting on it has a passion for the product. So we try to give people clients they want to work with. Like, oh, this is fun. This is exciting. This is really cool. Hmm. That kind of thing. So we, 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 you know, those are that's the blend of things we look for. So then we spin up the team. And then it takes about, you know, two weeks of back and forth to get up to speed. Um, you know, by the second week, they're presenting some ideas and then going back and forth. And so two to three weeks in, we're up and live, running ads, sending emails, depending on what we're doing. Um, and then from there, that's where we're different. We're ebbing and flowing and changing things on a you know monthly basis to be like, hey, listen, we're looking at Facebook. It's not performing the way we wanted to. Shut that down. Let's put that money into search. Let's change this. Let's change that. And that's mm-hmm. what we get. Another big differentiator for us. I I actually we compensate our people and bonus them based on the retention of a client, not how much money they get off a client. Mm-hmm. So it's how many months they've been with us. So after up to six months, there's nothing because that's just a failure. But from six to nine months, they get a bonus of a certain amount. Then nine to twelve, it goes up. Twelve to fifteen, it goes up. And after fifteen months with us, they get a you know the highest kind of level of bonus. But it, wow. it's consistent. They keep getting that bonus. Right. So for a P team. They don't want to just push them to spend money or to do things that are going to hurt their business. They want to push them for long-term success so they keep working with us. And so through that incentive, we've been able to like make sure they make the right decisions. And that, that's something that I'm a big student of is how do you incentivize for the right alignment of interest? Yeah, that's huge. Because when I think of ever having a product and if I were to hire out a team like you guys, <laughs> it's really hard to trust that the team will care enough (laughs) you know what i mean like it's hard especially for something that's like a a recurring a monthly type thing it's like you know by month four are you going to care this much and so it's great that you guys have incentivized the team to care as much and not just financially or whatever with bonuses but also that you're aligning them with products or services that they care about too i think that's a really really good and smart system for it so uh that's great man so i I have a few questions not really related to what you guys do but more related to marketing so i'm kind of i'm I'm picturing you know a 20 year old uh man or woman who's wanting to launch a company what would you suggest for them uh, just starting out to focus in their marketing? What's something they should focus on maybe above all else in their marketing for their product or service? What should they focus on? Um, well, product, yeah, definitely product or service. Like the thing is, I, I will say right now, whether it's your product or service, if it's good, marketing's easy. If it's bad, marketing's impossible. Like it, it is that simple. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like as much as we'll, like I just mentioned, we tripled a company, you know, Arna Jane's revenue. That's because they have an amazing product and we just, mm. just, you know, put a few things into place. If they had a crap product, we wouldn't have done that. Right. So that is number one. And that is frankly what I feel like most people should focus on. And then <coughs> number two, you know, when we look at marketing, it's, it's actually, I, I don't want to say focus on one thing because I think the problem is that is what happens. People come in and go, I just need to do my advertising and get going and then I'll worry about other things. And without a fully fleshed out marketing strategy, it's kind of, there's, we look at it as three pillars, which I'll explain in a sec. And it's kind of like a tripod. If you kick one leg out, the whole thing falls down. Mm-hmm. And like, we see that over and over again. And so those three pillars we talk about are awareness, nurturing, trust. So awareness is advertising, et cetera. It's building awareness for your brand, letting top, you know, top of the funnel, letting people know you exist in some way. Nurturing is once they become aware of you, what do you do to actually follow up with them? Because nobody buys something, that, and I'm speaking hyperbola, but most people don't buy something the first time they see it. Um, and so it takes time to follow up and to stay in front of them, et cetera. And then the last piece, trust, is you know everything before that is like, you're saying you're great, you're following up, you, it's just about you and your company and telling them something. But if they've never heard of you, like there's no, they need validation, they need whether it's press or testimonials or something that says, I'm actually going to receive what you're saying I'm going to receive. Because of course you're saying that, but how do I, how can I trust that? And so those three pieces, like you need to cover all three. You need to build awareness because without top of the funnel, you're you're not reaching anyone. And then once you build that, you have to nurture it because if not, they're all just going to fall off. And then you have to have trust or none of them are going to convert. And so 
that's kind of how we look at it. And so when you're thinking about a marketing strategy, just make sure you cover those three things in some way for every customer. Got it. That's awesome. So I know earlier you said uh, one of the greatest myths is that things are shifting and changing all the time in, in marketing. And it's a super fast race all the time. Um, but I'm yep. curious, what it, is there anything you see like on the landscape that you're curious about or kind of anticipating in the future of marketing? Is there anything that stands out to you yeah. as something you want to pay attention to specifically? Yeah, I mean, you know, with machine learning and AI and, you know, whatever you want to call it these days, it's not there yet. Like programmatic buying isn't there yet. Like it's just nothing, you know, AI is not smart enough yet. If you take Ray Kurzweil's example, like we, our computers are a little smarter than a mouse at this point. Like we're, mm. it's just not that smart enough to optimize everything for you, but it is making a lot more possible in the sense of uh, almost one to one marketing. So like now you're getting to a point where, based on triggers, based on behaviors, based on a lot of things, you can really start to segment really deeply your customer base so that you can really target them with advertising, email, messages, et cetera, that fit really close to them and who they are. And that's just going to have a you know, higher efficacy you know, inherently. And so that's going to get really interesting because it's also a good user experience. Like, you know, People complain about the creepiness of like the Facebook algorithm and how why do, how do they know that I like this brand? Like, that's creepy. And to me, it's like, wait, so I now, instead of seeing ads for Viagra on a daily basis when I was 13 <laughs> years old, right? I actually get advertisements that are worth, you know, that I may want to see. I think that's great. Right. Like, I think it's a good thing for the economy. I think it's a good thing for the consumer. It's a good thing for obviously businesses too. So as that gets deeper, I think it gets even more interesting. And like where we're going to end up, where we should end up pretty quick, is when I check in on face, like, and it'll get even more creepy than this, but when I check in that I'm flying, let's say from LA to Portland on Facebook, you know, in October, just giving an example, and it goes, it has a list of my shopping history as well. It goes, hey, you actually haven't bought a jacket in a while. Why don't you buy this nice tie going a jacket? We'll have it delivered to your hotel in Portland because it's actually only 40 degrees there. And you've been in, you know, your Indian summer in LA when it's, you know, still in the 80s. You mm -hmm. probably need a decent jacket while you're up there. Like right. that's that is a message that is not far off from being able to happen, but it at scale because that's not an individual doing that. I mean, machine can do that at scale. That it's just constantly, obviously it ties into Facebook, et cetera. But that is a product that should exist with a company like Facebook that has that data. So as long as we keep using these platforms and giving data, then it starts to be able to target really, you know, again one to one. Which again, that that example of Maybe I actually did need a jacket. That ad could actually serve me well because I'm going, oh, shoot, you're right. I only have like that one sleep shirt. So perfect. Now I have a jacket for, and it'll be in Portland when I need it. So, you know, save the right. day. So right. that's the kind of thing that I think, that's what I think we can expect in the next few years. Nice. That is, that will be cool. And I, I hear your, your, opinion on that too because i've always thought like well if it makes your life easier and better i'm not completely opposed to it there are certain lines that i think everyone can you know that's a value judgment for everyone else you know everyone has their own opinion about that stuff but i think it's true that the shopping and consumer experience will only benefit from that as well you know um so you guys yeah. have a uh, you guys have a summit coming up how about you talk about that a little bit sure, sure. yeah so you know after a decade in the e-commerce industry what i found was there's uh, a lot of great trade shows and traditional trade shows where you have 10, 10 20,000 people walking the floors, you know, and big speakers speaking on stage and a lot of people learning in the crowd. But what I didn't see was a great like environment for people that have already reached their level of success to actually learn from each other and kind of build a community around that. And so I always wanted that when I had my own companies and, you know, I'd make my own, I'd have dinners and make my own network, but really bring something that brought together the top minds in e-commerce and direct consumer brands. And so we started Hawkfest last year was our first year, which is, you know, basically 200 of the top C-suites in e-commerce coming together for a day, uh, you know, for learning, uh, for networking, and also fun. We always in incorporate a bunch of quirky stuff to make it a fun day. Hmm. Um, this year, it's themed as the circus. So okay. uh, it should be good. Yeah, we, we have a circus tent. We have a lot going on there. A lot of surprises, too. So it should be fun. But yeah, it's... The idea is again, like if you're just, we, we look for people doing uh, about over five million in revenue on e-commerce and uh, as a C-suite, and then you know invites are open. It's hawkfest.com, H-A-W-K-E-F-E-S-T. 
But last year was awesome. I mean, we had, you know, Dollar Shave Club, Me Undies, Honest Company, uh, Grunt Style, all these massive, massive, massive e-commerce brands uh, in, in the room for a day and learn, again, learning from each other, sharing with each other. And so doing the same thing this year, we just, we learned a lot of good things from last year to make it even better. Awesome, man. And when is that? That is October 4th Awesome. in Santa Monica. Sweet. Cool. And, uh, yeah, we'll put links in the show notes to all that, all that information. So Eric, where can people connect with you guys online? I'm assuming your site, is there anywhere else that's good to, to keep up with what you guys are working on? Sure. I mean, uh, for me personally, I'm on every social media platform is just at or slash Eric Huberman, E-R-I-K-H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N. So always happy to connect. And yeah, Hawk Media on every platform except Twitter. We still can't get it. So we're go Hawk. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on. We appreciate your expert knowledge. And I know uh, a lot of people are going to learn from this interview. So again, thank you so much for being our guest today. Yep. Thank you as well. Talk to you soon. That was my interview with Eric Huberman. So please make sure to go check out everything he is doing at Hawk Media and make sure to connect with him online. Thank you so much for being on this week, Eric. This podcast is made by GadgetFlow, and we are proud to be the number one platform to find new and awesome gadgets. So make sure to check out the site for all the new products we're curating every single day. We'll be back next week with another new episode. So in the meantime, please head over to iTunes and give us a great five-star rating and review for our show. Thank you so much for listening to the GadgetFlow podcast.